Web Marketing Networks podcast, episode 55 with Matt Michaelowitz. Welcome to the Web Marketing Networks podcast. Come behind the scenes of real life marketing experiments and listen in as amazing guests confess the truth about what really works. Now, here are your hosts, Adam Franklin and Toby Jenkins. My name is Adam Franklin, and you are listening to the Web Marketing That Works podcast. This is the show for people who love marketing on the web. And today's guest is Matt Michaelowitz, the author of Life in Half a Second. And on today's show, you'll be taken behind the scenes of real life marketing experiments where we look at the good, the bad, and the ugly. We confess what's failed and reveal the truth about what really works. This podcast is brought to you by our book, also called Web Marketing That Works, and specifically the bonus 33 templates that go with it. So you can get your hands on those for free at bluewiremedia.com.au slash book. So the guest today is Matt Michaelowitz, and we're going to look at his own experiences with running his businesses, which he's built up and sold for tens of millions of dollars, as well as his own book marketing experience because he tells an interesting story of trying to take what worked for multi-million dollar software sales and try to apply it to book marketing and he talks to us about the difference between the two. We'll also hear some really cool stories about how he was able to reach out and connect with a Fortune 500 CEO as well as Arnold Schwarzenegger. So we're in for a treat. Uh, Please welcome Matthew Michaelowitz. So I'm pleased to welcome Matthew Michalowicz to the show. Welcome, Matt. Thanks, Adam. A pleasure to be here. So Matthew rocked his keynote at the Pro Blogger event. So I reached out to him afterwards and asked him on this podcast. I've actually known of Matt for quite a while since he's one of the key person of influence mentors and Aussie listeners will have a chance to see him live on the KPI Roadshow in 2015. Matt is also an international expert in entrepreneurship success psychology, and I'm inclined to say he's also an expert on Arnold Schwarzenegger. (laughs) He has a track record of selling his businesses for tens of millions of dollars as well. I devoured his latest book called Life in Half a Second, How to Achieve Success Before It's Too Late, and I'm very keen to share more with listeners today. So Matt, that's a very brief overview of some of your many accomplishments. Would you mind giving us a brief overview of your book? Yeah, look, I've been uh, fascinated with the subject of success for a long time, probably, you know, since a little kid, because you see uh, people that are successful and you wonder as a, as a child or as an adolescent, what do they do to achieve success? And as you enter adulthood and become more educated and see more and understand business, or real estate development or stock markets, et cetera, some of those mysteries are revealed. But uh, the fascination never went away. So I've been collecting um, data, research, information on the subject of success from a scientific point of view. What's proven to work that's supported by studies that's not based on opinion or uh, someone's perspective of success. And I had the opportunity about a couple of years ago after selling the last company to sit down over a four or five month period and condense all of that research into the five factors that drive success across any discipline. So that's probably the easiest explanation. It's a book about how to achieve success using scientifically proven principles. What I particularly loved about the book was that sense of urgency that and you're explaining that life in half a second, that in fact, you know, we've been on the planet, what, 300 million years? And if you were to condense the amount of time that human beings have been on the planet, if we condense that down to the equivalent of one year, then our actual lifetime for you or myself would be about half a second. So what I loved was that sense that we don't have much time on the planet. So we've really just got to get in there and make it happen. Absolutely. I mean, our whole lifespan is like a cosmic moment. And, you know, some people make the most of it. Others kind of uh, have a sense of regret when uh, when they reach their twilight years. So I really believe in urgency and making the most of the time you've got. Now, this is a marketing podcast. And I think a lot of what you spoke about in the book is so relevant for marketing. 
particularly the part early on in the book where you talk about setting goals. And in the book, you speak about how so many people are living in poverty, so many people are unhappy with their lives, and yet fewer than 1% of people actually set goals and document them and review them regularly. Do you have any any sort of insight into why people don't do this if it's so proven scientifically and historically to have such powerful benefits? Yeah, I, I, my, my view is that the primary mover of success in any field is really desire to achieve success. And, and many people use different words to describe desire. They call it ambition or drive or hunger. All of those things summed up are really someone's desire to achieve. And, and my general observation is that that emotion, that, you know, that feeling when you wake up in the morning and you're, you're on fire to achieve a goal or an objective or something that you care deeply about is missing for most people. So no matter how bad their situation is, you know, they don't like their job. They don't like the relationship that they're in. They don't like where they live. They don't like X, Y, Z about their life. They, they don't do anything about it, including, you know, setting goals to do something about it. And the only conclusion that we can draw from that is their desire to do something about it just isn't strong enough. Because if it was, then they would do something about it. They'd get off their ass and axe and, uh, and set goals and move towards a different outcome. And unfortunately, the vast majority of people don't do that. I see that a lot in the marketing world too. Like a lot of people want certain levels of success in marketing or leads or, or revenue coming through, say, their website, for example. But when push comes to shove, there's a lot of action and activity that's required to make it happen. And at the end of the day, sometimes people don't necessarily want to put in that amount of effort. So I guess it probably does come down to that desire that you speak about. Yeah, I mean, I've mentored entrepreneurs for a long time, more than 10 years. And Every entrepreneur raises their hand and says, oh, gosh, I'd love to build a business and sell it. And then you say, right, yeah, look, here are, in your field, whatever that is, you know, personal training, restaurant, I don't care what it is, technology, here are the things you've got to do. You've got to do this, you've got to do that, you've got to do this. And then all of a sudden they look at that and say, oh, Jesus, you know, that's, that's a lot of work. I'm not sure if I want to do all of that. And it, again, it comes back to how badly you want the outcome. If you really wanted to build a business and sell it, you'd do those things because that's what other people are doing that are selling their businesses. And if you don't, it can only imply that you don't want the outcome bad enough. Sure, sure. Now let's circle back to marketing. And I guess you've not only built businesses and sold businesses, but I imagine marketing has been a big part of that. Yep. Can you dive a little bit deeper into your marketing philosophy and how that's applied to both your businesses and your book? Yeah, absolutely. So look, my take on all businesses is there are three primary components. First, there's marketing, which my measure of success in marketing is generating leads, generating inquiries, getting the phone to ring, getting someone online to to type uh, an inquiry to you saying that they're interested in your products or services. And the measure of success in terms of generating leads comes at a cost. So really effective marketing is how many leads did we generate and did we generate them at the minimum cost possible. The second stage of a business is converting those leads into customers, which is sales. And that's a very, very different area from marketing. And once you actually convert a prospect into a customer or a lead into a customer, then you, then you move into the third component of your business, which is delivery. You give them whatever it is that you've sold them, whether it's a book or a software application or personal training uh, sessions, it doesn't matter. So it starts with marketing. That's the beginning of the funnel. Um, you've got to generate leads that you can actually push through that three-step process to generate customers out the other side. So in, whether it's a, a business that I've run in the past or the book, the most important thing for me, Adam, is knowing the customer, trying to understand who are they, what is their psychology, how do they buy, if they search for a product like yours, what words they use to search it with, where do they go to get information, what associations do they belong to. You almost build kind of like an FBI agent, what is the profile of the person that you're chasing? Here, here you're chasing customers, what is their profile? And based upon that profile, how can we go and catch them? How can we go and reach them, push messages to them, make them aware of what we're offering? So for me, the most important thing is to know your customer, and that's the starting point of marketing. You made an interesting point there that marketing is the first step and then sales is the second step, but you said that they were vastly different. A lot of people these days seem to be saying that a lot more of that buying decision-making process happens 
online and happens well before they actually interact with a company. What's your take on the change between marketing and sales over the last sort of five or 10 years? Yeah, I, I still believe in the statement that they're very, very different areas. What's changed is consumers or corporate customers are more educated. Knowledge is more readily available. You know, if you go back 20 years to the advent of the internet, there wasn't a whole lot of information. So salespeople were the masters of information. If you wanted information about a refrigerator or a car or a trip overseas, you, the salespeople, they'd be marketing to get you to the store or or the venue, and then the salesperson would be the guardian of the knowledge, their special place in the chain. They were the experts. If you want to buy a car, you go to the salesperson, they explain it. What's changed in 20 years is that knowledge that used to be sacred to the salesperson has become ubiquitous. It's everywhere. You can access it online. So the customer is now more educated, more sophisticated, and more knowledgeable when they enter into the sales process, which puts enormous pressure on companies to raise their gain in sales because sometimes you could have the situation where the buyer knows more than the salesperson, and that's bad for the company and in, in a wide variety of different areas. So I think the original statement holds true. Marketing, in my view, is very different from sales, and sales has changed only in the sense that buyers are more sophisticated and knowledgeable. And so does that mean that marketers then have the obligation to be educating people with their content and their marketing more so in the pre-internet days and that I guess in the pre-internet days their job was to get them to the salesperson to then understand the product? Do that marketers now need to educate the people before they see a salesperson? Yeah, I mean, again, my opinion there's an old adage that the more time you spend with a product or service, the more likely you are to buy it. So if your competitors are educating potential customers, that means your competitors are spending more time with your potential customers than you are. So customers are increasingly become wanting to become more educated and knowledgeable. So marketing needs to be a process to enable that, whether that's, you know, blogs or ebooks or online content that can be accessed. And the more information you provide consumers, you're educating them, but they're also spending time with you. They're beginning to view your company and your position as, as one of uh, leadership or uh, trusted advice, and then it makes it easier to enter the sales process and convert them into a customer. So I think a- absolutely marketing has changed from you know the traditional 80s, 90s, let's brand, let's get our name out there, all of that old stuff that you hear about marketing, to more about how do you actually educate the consumer, provide them content that's valuable, spend time with them in a virtual sense that they're reading or viewing or listening to your material so that you set yourself up for the sale in a more easy and cost-effective manner. Now, looking back over your book career and your business career, reflecting on some of the marketing that you have done, can we take a moment to reflect on the good, the bad, and possibly the ugly so firstly, what's worked well? Yeah, so I, I want to preface it that there's three types of entrepreneurs, broadly speaking. The majority are an inventor type entrepreneurs. They invent an app, software application, a widget, and then they try to commercialize it. Uh, there's entrepreneurs that are great salespeople, and I put myself into this category. I've got a finance degree, but I've spent my whole life trying to understand sales, relationship selling, pipeline management, managing sales teams. So I come from a natural sales background. And then there are people that are great marketers, creating you know, viral content, creating visibility in the marketplace and so on. So just my strength in my businesses has been that middle component. And I've surrounded myself with other people that are strong in those other parts. But if you look at businesses, especially the businesses that I've run, which have been business to business, large scale sales, large dollar value, long sales cycles, you know, the traditional enterprise sale where it might take you one year to sell something to a very big company, you know, an ASX 50 business, and the value of the deal might be a million or a multi-million dollar deal. The marketing process there is a very, very different from a consumer-based marketing approach where you're selling a low value product like a book, 10, 20, 30 bucks, whatever it is, you're trying to reach consumers and the purchase decision oftentimes can be instantaneous. They read a, a section of it, 
they like what they read and all of a sudden that translates into a purchase decision. So I've operated at both spectrums and marketing isn't my primary passion or love in life. It's sales. It's actually relationship selling, building relationships with people and going on a journey with them. But being in those two sides of marketing, different people will find comfort in different areas. Like in the low value product consumers, everything is online. Everything is about uh, having a presence, creating content online, being viral, uh, building awareness, uh, building communities around your product and so on. That is Not that it doesn't exist on the other end of the spectrum, but no one buys a multi-million dollar software system because of Twitter posts or what's on your Facebook account or any of that kind of stuff. So marketing is very, very different on those two different spectrums. Does that make sense? Yeah, it absolutely does. I mean, uh, if it's going to take a year to make that decision and and over a million dollars to invest, then it's going to be a very considered purchase and no doubt much much more focus on the relationship and that value selling. Yeah, and marketing well. plays less of a role in those kind of uh, environments for the reason that once the lead exists, they're aware of your company and they've made contact, you're now in sales. And that one year process is not them reading content online or listening to your Twitter feed or checking out your Facebook page. That one year process is interacting with the sales component of your company. And it might be tenders, it might be product demonstrations, it might be cost benefit, business case development and so forth. So in the big end of town, big purchases are typically more sales focused than they are marketing focused. Whereas this is, again, just my opinion. And when you get to low value items, it's more marketing heavy and sales is usually very quick or instantaneous. And often self-service, isn't it? There's no salesperson involved with a low purchase price item. So now let's look at the other end. What hasn't worked so well or have there been any real shockers in terms of stuff that you've done over your career in terms of, I guess, specifically marketing, but possibly sales as well? Yeah, so in business, given that it's relationship heavy, face-to-face heavy, if a business is going to spend more than a million dollars, it's usually a decision by a committee or a capital allocation process and so forth. What we've done very, very well is creating events or environments where we can interact face-to-face with potential buyers, with existing customers and so forth. And so I don't think in my businesses I've had any spectacular marketing failures. I mean, the biggest success we ever had was we spent a quarter of a million dollars putting on an event that was called uh, the Integrated Planning and Optimization Summit in Adelaide. It attracted 600 people from all around Australia that was just targeted to our specific industry, which was process supply chains, which was ports, rail, mining companies, agriculture. We put on this amazing event where it had um, entertainment, dinner, lunches. There was, I think, 30 keynote speakers and so forth. And out of that, it generated tremendous amount of leads. It generated new business with existing customers. And it also positioned us in the sector as a company that has thought leadership on this subject. So high cost, huge returns, and it worked. Now, where I can talk about failures is around book marketing. So I come from this world of big dollars, face-to-face, long sales cycle. And when I wrote Life in Half a Second, I kind of brought that mentality into book promotion. And the world has changed tremendously over the last 10 years since I wrote my last book, What Incredibility. So 10 years ago, there was much less social media, much less online presence. The way of writing books is you write something, you get a publisher, you get a publicist, you go through traditional media channels, TV, radio, print, physical book launches, and so forth, which is very synonymous with the way I I ran business marketing in in large-scale sales. And so bringing that mentality in the year 2013 to book marketing was a failure because physical book launches, not that they've become irrelevant, but close to it, being in papers, physical print, and so forth, or radio, again, it doesn't have the weight or the bearing that it used to have. Everything has moved, again, from my perspective, into the online space. And that hasn't been my area of expertise or the thing that I am the most knowledgeable about. So the approach taken for the book was a failure compared to what it would have been if we had just said, instead of all of this physical stuff, let's focus on the online space. Awesome. Awesome. That's very interesting. 
And Matt, if you're starting from scratch, how might you go about your marketing based on what you know? Yeah. You know, I've created a new company three months ago called Complexica. It's going to be building a product for the really the next year. We've secured foundation customers. We're going through a development cycle, and then at the end of next year, we'll launch it. So it is starting from scratch, new company, new brand, new products. Nothing carries over from anything that we've done before. It's a brand new start. So you've got to build brand. You've got to build awareness and so on. But it starts with the, the thing that I said at the beginning of our talk. Who is the customer? You know, And, and again, we're selling to businesses, and, and it's a large value sale. So who buys in the businesses that we're targeting? Why do they buy? What problems are we solving for them? What's the benefit of solving these problems? Is there a measurable outcome that we can guarantee or talk to in the marketing or sales process? And then once we have that picture of our potential customer, we then extend it by saying, where do these customers exist? What do they read? What kind of events do they go to? What are the topics that they're interested in? What associations do they belong to? So we're building this kind of profile and picture of the people that we want to reach, and that's going to drive the marketing plan because you want to be where they are with the right message that's going to resonate with them. Brilliant, brilliant. Now, I know marketing sales is more your thing than marketing specifically, but you do you obviously have picked up a tremendous amount over the uh, decades that you've been in business. Is there a specific marketing tactic that brings you the most joy? Um, so the honest answer is no. The joy for me is getting a lead and converting them to a customer. Again, it comes back to sales. Uh, marketing for me is, is very non-personal. If you're marketing online or if you're marketing through advertising and, and so forth, your again, objective is to generate the lead and it for me is a very non personal thing. What I really enjoy and I get a lot of, you know, a kick out of is interacting with people when all of a sudden the phone rings or they have an inquiry online and they say, Look, we heard about you through XYZ advertising, we saw you at an event or whatever the case might be and the product you were describing sounds really interesting and it could be a potential fit for our business. We'd like to talk further. That's the moment of joy for me when marketing has been successful, it has generated a lead, and then you transition into sales, build a relationship, build business case, uh, demonstrate value and so forth, and over some period of time, translate that into a customer. Okay. Let me rephrase it slightly and, and I guess look at the speaking angle. Does the public speaking that, that I've seen you do, does that bring you a lot of joy? Yes. Yeah, but I, I haven't viewed that as marketing. Really? I, I, yeah. I've always, my father's been an academic for 40 years. I've always enjoyed education. I've, I teach at Adelaide Uni to this day. I teach a master's class on entrepreneurship every year. I write books and I speak. And all of that fits under a category of education. And I believe that you become better or the best you can be or you develop mastery in a subject if you can teach it as well as practice it because when i teach something when i like 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 when i do a keynote and i have 45 minutes to condense 20 years of entrepreneurship experience into 45 minutes it really forces me to analyze what's worked why did it work how could you teach someone else the key messages the key points in a very limited period of time and then when you begin thinking about it you gain new insights into what you've done and and potentially the causes of, of why you were successful were different to what you, from what you initially thought. So in this category of education, I love it and I'm hugely passionate about it because it makes me a better entrepreneur if I'm forced to teach others what I've done to become successful. So I, I've never viewed that as marketing. I've always put it under the category of education. <laughs> that, that's really interesting because I see marketing, I see our primary responsibility as marketers and people listening to the show, our primary responsibility as marketers is to teach people and to educate people and to help them learn new things. So I see them intrinsically tied together. So it's interesting that I see you as a fantastic marketer because of the way you write in your books and the way that you present from the stage. Interesting that you see that not as marketing but as education because... Yeah, I think, I think your point is spot on, Adam, and I think it depends on 
if I was selling a product, like say I was a business coach, which I'm not, but say I sold 12-week business acceleration programs that you could sign up for and you'd be in a group with me and blah, 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 then all of those things that we just described, the education would be a feeder, would be marketing into the product that I'm selling. So the only reason I don't view them as marketing is there's nothing to buy. Yes. Right? So, so that, that's the, the only difference. So I'm out there on stage and I give you a keynote. Yeah, you can buy the book, but that's really not the reason I'm doing keynotes or teaching at Adelaide University or writing a book. Say I wrote Life in Half a Second and I had a program that you could implement with me to actually implement the principles in the book. Then, yes, the book would be not only education, but it would be a marketing feeder into the product that I'm selling. So I agree with you 100% and everything that I do in the bucket of education could be marketing and very effective marketing if there was an actual product or service behind it that was being offered. That makes total sense. That makes total sense. Now, there's a really interesting concept in your book that I think applies beautifully to business and marketing and that's the idea of the goal pyramid. Yes. And my layman's interpretation of that is you might have a, a 10-year goal to build a $10 million business or you might have a 10-year goal to be like Arnold Schwarzenegger and be the world bodybuilding champion or become a successful Hollywood actor or become a successful governor. But that goal on its own really needs to be broken down into subsets in order to get there and in order to make it not only more achievable but actually to outline the steps you need to take. Can you take us through this concept of a goal pyramid and how we might actually apply it to business or marketing? Yeah, absolutely. So, again, coming back to research, which was the focus of the book, research has shown that if you break a big goal down into smaller goals by a process called unpacking the goal, it becomes more achievable. And it's perfectly logical. If you have some big goal all of a sudden you want to increase, you want to double the revenue and profit of your business in 12 months. That's a pretty significant goal. And if that goal is just sitting there on its own by itself, it's a pretty big jump. You know, what do you do when you wake up the next day? What action are you going to take to try to double your revenue and your profit? So there's typically this big gap between where we are and the goals that we've set and the goals seem unattainable. So what the goal pyramid does is it takes the primary goal and forces you to ask one question. What do I need to do in order for that to happen? Which is, I mean, this is a fabulous question to be asking. So in other words, what do I need to do to double my revenue and double my profit in 12 months? What needs to happen? Well, the first thing that needs to happen is you need more customers, right? You are either going to sell more to your existing customers You're either going to charge more or you're going to have more customers or some combination thereof. So you might put that underneath your primary goal. You might say, look, I need to increase my customers by 50% this year and I need to actually charge more and I need to introduce a new product or service, right? And those three things are going to enable me to double revenue and double profit. And then again, you ask the same question, all right, what needs to happen in order for me to get 50% more customers. That's not going to happen by sleeping at night and waking up in the morning and all of a sudden you're lining up at your doorstep. You've actually got to do something in order for that outcome to be realized. Well, then you get to marketing. So to generate more leads, what do I need to do? Because more leads are going to equate into more customers. And then you keep breaking that down. To generate more leads, I might need to develop a more robust online marketing strategy. I might need to raise my profile within the customers that I'm targeting, which might be the associations, it might be different journals that they read, whatever the case might be. So all of a sudden, you take a goal that seems quite a big step, and you break it down into all of these steps, which might be eight steps or 10 steps, that are much more bite-sized and easier for you to attack. And then all of a sudden, the big goal becomes more attainable. You wake up in the morning and you say, right, yo, what I need to be doing for this week or next week is working on my online strategy. I also need to be doing this. I also need to be doing that. That's going to lead into having more customers. I also need to investigate what other product or service I can offer. So the goal pyramid becomes really your one-page plan of how you're going to achieve the goal that you set for yourself. And again, it's proven through research and science that this is a very effective way of increasing the probability of reaching your goals. When I apply that to a marketing setting, you know, when I'm thinking about it in relation to my own marketing, but also what I would teach to clients, it can make it a lot more 
achievable, I think, because you can break it down. Instead of just saying, I want to have traffic of this and revenue of, you know, a million dollars through my website, it can really be broken down and you can see it when you draw out the goal pyramid that, well, okay, that's going to mean I need to do a certain number of webinars to drive sales and I'm going to need to do a certain number of product launches, a certain number of joint ventures. And, you know, in order to get those things, what have I got to do? Well, I've got to do more guest blogging. I've got to optimize my landing pages better. I've got to do weekly emails. I've got to build a podcast and build an audience there. And so each of those building blocks, when you put them on top of one another, you can eventually build that pyramid to, you know, see that end goal that you've got. But then that can translate into an action plan for, well, who am I going to approach to guest blog for? What template or tool am I going to release as a landing page to help you know, grow my email list? So I, I see huge value in that goal pyramid structure and applying it particularly to a web marketing setting. Yeah, I, I sit on a board, Adam, of a company where I was, I was really added to the board to increase sales and introduce sales and marketing techniques that could directly drive revenue and profit. And so the goal for the company when I came in was we want to increase leads. And, you know, as I write in the book, loose terms to describe goals is not an effective goal setting approach. So I said, what does more leads mean? If we increase our leads by 1% or five leads a year, is that going to be a good outcome? No. So we defined that what we really wanted to do was double the amount of leads coming into the business in, over a 12 month period with the same quality. So then the next thing is, what are we going to do? to make that happen. It's not going to happen by itself. So what do we need to do? And just like you said, you break it down into these different areas, whether it's online and then online, you break down further, whether it's AdWords on LinkedIn or I mean, ads on LinkedIn or Facebook or AdWords on Google or SEO optimization or blogging or podcast. So you've got this whole stream of online. Then you've got this physical stream where we should run some events. Where should we run them? Who should we invite? How should we structure? So it creates this whole great discussion around what are we going to do strategically and tactically to execute on this goal and then you fill it into the goal pyramid and then just like you said it's easier to take action because you're dealing with the goal in bite-sized pieces rather than the whole thing in one lump brilliant brilliant now matt who have you learned from over the years and the reason i asked that i asked most guests this question but you've put together boards including former heads of state, Nobel Peace Prize winners, Fortune 500 CEOs. You've got this amazing ability to assemble a team. So I'm really keen to learn who you have learned from over the years and whether that's their books or blogs or in person, people that we can then look to as well to to learn. Yeah, great question. First of all, I've had the mindset all my life that you're never going to know it all. There's always going to be people better than you. You need to have this mentality and attitude of lifelong learning and education. So I've always had that all my life. I always want to learn. That's step one. Because if you ever get to a point where you think you know it all, you're the best or whatever, that's like the beginning of the end. The second thing is I only look to people that have accomplished what I want to do. So there's so much noise in the world. Everyone's got a blog. Everyone's got a podcast. Everyone's got a a book. And everyone wants to shower you with opinions on how you should go about doing something. So, or even in person, all your friends have opinions, all of the people, and everyone's got them. People love giving opinions. So how do you cut through that noise? Step two is only look to people that have accomplished what you want to accomplish. That is the best filter for taking advice. I'm not interested in advice. I'm interested in advice from people that have walked the talk. So that immediately cuts out 99 and a half percent of all the stuff out there. You want to be the best bodybuilder in the world, you're not going to listen to the anorexic guy uh, sitting in the corner of the gym telling you about how to bulk up. You're going to turn to the best bodybuilders in the world and try to see and figure out what they did. So, and then the third thing is once you have an attitude of lifelong learning and you know what you want to accomplish, you filter out the people that haven't done it and you just focus on the ones at the top, you try to get close to them. Which, and I described this in life in half a second as well. And you can get close to people in a number of ways. I mean, I haven't spent a lot of time with Arnold Schwarzenegger. I've met him on a couple of occasions. I've had conversations with him and, and we've talked about different subjects, but he's not a person that I can call up 
or uh, or have dinner with every week. But I feel like I've spent a lot of time with him because I've read his books, I've read books about him, I've watched his in- interviews and so forth, and all of that has given me insights into his character, into his attitudes, into his philosophy about life and success. So I think it's critical that once we identify the people, which can be around us in our immediate environment, they could be successful business people or athletes, just people that we respect, we have to try to get close to them, either through meetings physically and discussions or in a more distance manner where we read their material, we listen to the interviews that are available, and we try to gain insights into what makes them successful. And that needs to be a continuous process. It's not a one-time thing where you know you wake up one day, you say, I'm going to start a business, so for the next six months, I'm going to educate myself, and then I'm going to put that away into a box and never address it away again. So you need to be constantly making your yourself the best that you can be by going through this type of process. I'm a very big fan of the whole process of how people reach out to influencers or people that they admire. Can you talk me through how you actually got in touch with Arnie and then how you went about, you know, meeting him in person and forming that relationship? Well, I, I think in any high-level person, I mean, it comes back to the same philosophy in business. Say you want to meet the CEO of BHP or the CEO, you know, any high level person, whether it's a person that you want to get advice from or get mentorship from or a person that you want to do business with, how are you going to get their attention? How are you going to get in front of them? And the same old principles apply. The easiest way to get in front of someone is through a trusted introduction, through a referral. Do you know someone that they know? Do you know someone that knows someone that they know? I remember pitching a Fortune 500 CEO in the United States who was just, you know, just this unbelievably successful and hard to reach person. And when I targeted him, like, this is a person I want to go and pitch. I want to ask them to join my board. I want them to invest in the company. I want them to be part of my journey. I reached out again to all the people I knew. Does anyone know him? And I reached out to hundreds of people. And this was before LinkedIn and all of that kind of stuff, which makes it easy today. And the only path I found to this CEO was that one of the investors in my company, next door neighbor's uncle, had worked with the CEO 12 years ago. It was as tenuous as that. And I had to go to the uh, investor's next door neighbor. I had to pitch them to get an introduction to the uncle. Then I had to pitch the uncle. And then the uncle had to go and pitch this Fortune 500 CEO, which it turned out that he was able to um, have a meeting with me. And then some months later, I was able to pitch the CEO. So if it was easy, everyone would do it. It's difficult. Sometimes the connections are very tenuous and very weak. But again, if you want it bad enough, you're going to give it a go. And how about Arnie? Arnie was easy. I mean, he in the United States, there's lots of events that he spoke at mm-hmm. where there was opportunity to buy higher cost tickets where you could meet him. And the same with Australia. He visited Australia, I think it was a year and a half ago. He visited three cities. And in each city, if you wanted to spend a lot of money, you, you could be in a room where there was going to be 10 or 15 people with you and, uh, and Arnold and spend an hour or two hours with him. And I ended up buying many of those tickets and me and my family went to that and so forth. So in some cases, it's easy like that if, if you're willing to pay. And in other cases, you've got to find an indirect route. Wonderful. I love stories like that. Now, Matt, have you got any closing thoughts or final pieces of advice that you'd just love to get off your chest before we call it a day? Yeah, look, my view of small businesses is that, again, coming back to those three components, marketing, sales, delivery, is that I don't know what the statistic is, Adam, but I got, if I was going to take a guess, I'd have to take say it's 80 to 90% plus. Most small businesses are created by people that are experts in the delivery. And I call these people technicians, whether it's a accountant, lawyer, personal trainer, software engineer, et cetera. They're an expert in whatever it is that they're delivering. And they've studied that, they've practiced it, they really enjoy it, blah, blah, blah which means that they're not really an expert in marketing and sales. So the thing that I've always observed in business and I live by, it's not the best product that wins and it's not the best service that wins. It's oftentimes the best sales and marketing that wins. Usually the best products and services you've never heard of, 
because the owner of this business has been so ineffective in sales and marketing that they're just not visible. You've never even heard of them. So I, I, the closing advice that I can give to listeners is think about how much time you've spent studying, working in, educating yourself on your craft, whatever your craft is, fixing cars, training people, being a doctor, personal trainer, lawyer, account, doesn't matter. And how much training, education, knowledge, etc. how much time have you spent in the area of sales and marketing? And usually it's like, you know, 1% in sales and marketing to 99% in their particular craft. So the closing advice is if you really want to make a difference in your business and whatever you're doing in the business landscape, try to change that percentage. Not the other way, 99% to one, but try to make it a goal to get really knowledgeable and educated in the realm of sales and marketing over, say, the next 24 months, because that is going to directly impact your business and is going to make a fundamental difference to your revenue and bottom line. And finally, Matt, how can listeners connect with you? Uh, probably the easiest is LinkedIn. Um, I'm, I'm accessible. I've got my email, I think, on my website, michaelwidge.com.au. And there's also a lot of uh, free videos available on the life in half a second dot com website where they can view and all the things we've talked about. I've made videos about. They don't even need to buy the book. And then the, in terms of a direct connection to send me a LinkedIn invite and I often send updates on what I'm up to. So that's probably the easiest. Fantastic. Well, I highly recommend buying the book, listeners. I read it in a couple of days. It's called Life in Half a Second. And if you don't read that and feel inspired to take the next steps with your business or whatever it is that you want to improve in your life, then I don't think there's any hope for you. But um, <laughs> it's, it's such an inspiring read. I, I left, I, I drew out my goal pyramids. It really resonated with me. It really reinforced a lot of the things that I believe in as well. So Matt, thank you so much for coming on the show. Absolute pleasure, Adam. Thanks for having me. No worries. And that wraps up my interview with Matt Michaelowitz. You may have noticed that my Polish pronunciation isn't quite all it could be, and I made a slight error in pronouncing his name at the start, but Matt Michaelowitz is the way to say it, and I hope he forgives me for calling him slightly the wrong name. So I really love that chat with Matt ever since I've seen him at that Pro Blogger event. I really wanted to dive deeper into some of the concepts of his book. Loved how he connected with that Fortune 500 CEO, and just the persistence and the strategy and the reaching out to people to get closer and closer to the source that he wants. And there's a lot of lessons for that, not only from, I guess, influencer outreach, but just being persistent and consistent with the marketing that we do on the web and to set the big goals, but then to break it down into bite-sized chunks. So literally that we know what are we doing today and does this actually help me achieve one of the stepping stones towards my big goal that I want to achieve, you know, maybe five or 10 years down the track. So I got a lot out of that chat with Matt. I hope you did too. And as I said at the end of the show, his book, Life in Half a Second, is very much worthwhile reading. It'll probably only take you a couple of hours. I'm not a quick reader, but I've managed to, I think, read it in in a couple of flights. So head over to Amazon and check that out. So this show is brought to you by our book called Web Marketing That Works and specifically the bonus 33 marketing templates that go with it. So if you want to get your hands on those, please head over to Blue Wire Media com.au slash book. Our intent is to deliver actionable advice. So we hope we've achieved that and your feedback and questions are always welcome. Please let me know via email, which is adam.franklin at bluewiremedia.com.au or tweet me, franklin underscore adam. Thanks for listening to the end. If you enjoyed the show, and I hope you did, I'd love it if you could leave us an honest review on iTunes. The more reviews we get, the more visibility we have in the iTunes search engine and the better quality guests we can bring you. So we totally appreciate your help there. Thank you and see you next time. (laughs) 